This is ESPN Classic, the Classic Sports Network. ESPN Classic welcomes you to the following presentation of the National Football League. felt that after you went through all that work the only thing you had to show for it was the film and you got to keep the film I mean that's the backbone that's what it all goes back to that's the heritage the film the old Bibles the bones in the ground they dig them up In 1962, for $3,000, my dad bought the film rights for the NFL championship game. And I was a fullback at Colorado College then, and I'll always remember his phone call to me. He said, I can see by your grades that all you've been doing out there is playing football and going to the movies. But that makes you uniquely qualified for this new job. So I quit school and came back to Philadelphia to work for my dad. And since then, NFL Films has been the only job I've ever had, 38 years. And you know, I thought I knew something about everything that we'd ever shot. But last year, Phil Tuckett, a producer who's been working with me for 31 years, found in our film vault some unmarked cans that they were so old they were rusted shut. Well, we opened them up, and inside was this uncut black and white negative film. And it must have been shot during the exhibition games prior to the 1964 season because I'd never seen any of this stuff. But after we looked at it, we said, boy, this is a great time capsule of the 1960s. So Phil decided to put together a research team and they dug even deeper into the archives to see what else they could find. This series is the result of that search. And we decided to call it the Lost Treasures of NFL Films because that's what they are, a never-before-seen record of the growth of pro football and also of the growth of that little company my dad started back in 1962. When my dad started filming pro football, he used to tell his cameraman, let the film run like water. We can't miss anything. Film's the cheapest thing we've got. Shoot everything that moves. He said, we're historians. We're recording the game for posterity. Now, a lot of this early footage never got used, but after more than 35 years in what Dad used to call the wine cellar, these shots are more valuable than ever. They've, they've aged very well. And now they're a colorful reminder of the way the game used to be. Forgotten footage also tells a story of Tiny Blair Motion Pictures. That was named after my sister and how it evolved into NFL films. And this was a time when Alice and Lombardi shared the field. How about those hats? Cheerleaders used megaphones in those days. Players drank out of the water bucket. All the kicking was done straight ahead by big men, not one skinny sidewinder in the group. Fans dressed like they were going to church. Look at this guy, though. He was, he was wearing something extra. Back then, you could smoke on the sidelines and up in the stands, and no one cared. Who knew about secondhand smoke? <laughs> then television started showing up on the sidelines. But this is what we were shooting at the time, these little wind-up Bell and Howe movie cameras trying to get close to the action, but yet without becoming part of it.
Seeing this footage for the first time reminds me of why I love this era so much. I was 21 when I went to work for Dad, and there were only 14 teams in the NFL. But I could tell you something about every player in the league. I could name every offensive line. They seemed larger than life to me then, and maybe even a little bit tougher than the players of today. Now, right from the start, we experimented with slow motion photography to show the subtleties of the game, uh, things that TV had overlooked. Dad felt that slow motion was pure cinema. This was movie making perfectly matched to the grace and the, the beauty and the violence of pro football. Who could forget Tom the Bomb Tracy? He's finishing up his career with the Redskins, and that's punter Bobby Joe Green. You can tell he's a kicker, he's not wearing a face mask. For a year, Phil and his guys dug and they explored and they scrounged through thousands of cans of film. Some of it's so rusted, you needed metal cutters to open them. What you'll see in this show is the best of 30 hours of lost treasures from the 1960s that we rediscovered and restored. Not one shot has ever been seen on television until now. And we not only found footage of all the great players of the day, but also some shots of other players that we shouldn't forget. And I thought it would be great to track down some of these guys and interview them for the first time. So you'll be meeting Joe Rutkins, Brady Keys, and the Catawba Claw. That's Bucky Pope during the next hour. Now, you might not remember them or, or even know who they were, but as far as I'm concerned, they were all lost treasures. ESPN Classic. This is ESPN Classic. I was always into sports. I, I was a jock all my life. And to me, the best sport to film at that time was pro football. Even the field is shaped like a movie screen, and uh, there's uh, eight seconds, and the play stops, and then there's another eight seconds, and the play stops. And th there was a lot of action. So, you know, you get a couple of guys who know a little bit about the game, and we decided that we're going to shoot pro football. Dad hired director Dan Endy, and Blair Motion Pictures paid $3,000 for the rights to the 62 championship game. Yeah, 1962. That's the game I'm talking about. And I think this game was about minus 10 with the chill factor. That's the wind blind. You know, that was just a severe afternoon to shoot movies of a football game. Well, thank God I didn't know more. I didn't realize that the film could freeze. I didn't realize that a cameraman, if he put his face against the camera, it would stick to the camera. So I didn't know about that. I just said, let's go. Shoot. That's all. Shoot everything that moves. And I'll never forget how cold it was in Yankee Stadium that day. And the wind. That was worse than the cold. And the pregame, YA Tittle's passes were getting blown all over the field. The quality of this footage amazes me. Uh, it was shot on ectochrome film stock, and for some reason Kodak stopped making it. It's too bad because look at this quality. 37 years later, no deterioration. The cold killed us. Our cameras weren't winterized. They would stop and start, and they'd leave what... See this? This is called a flash frame. And it'd make the shots too short to use in the edit, so a lot of the footage wasn't good enough. But when they did stay on long enough, we tried to get the kind of storytelling shots that Dan needed to make a film. Another obstacle which we faced in those days was the, uh, the equipment was archaic. I mean, we were shooting with Kodak Cine Specials, which were World War uh, uh, II cameras. The Aeroflex, the Zoomar lenses, the, uh, the film stock, none of it was uh, as good as it is today. So, I mean, in some respects, it's analogous to uh, a, a Wright Brothers aircraft compared with a, a jet plane today. The stuff just wasn't available to do the job, and 
even if it were available, none of us or very few of us had the real training to do it. So it, uh, there was a lot of on-the-job uh, training. One camera that ran well the whole game was this telephoto lens. And that was a big innovation back then, and we used it because we wanted to personalize the game. We wanted to portray the struggle as well as the strategy. But there were so many problems. I mean, my dad actually got physically sick with worry and anxiety, and he was in the Yankee dugout toilet most of the second half with diarrhea. He had to run. And that's where we got the, the name for that particular game, Pro Football's Longest Game, because it was a long game. When it got through, and they started to take the film out of the cameras, it started cracking and breaking. And that's when I said, oh my God, what have I got here? And they took the film, and I remember looking in laundry baskets in the locker room, and they were throwing it in the laundry baskets. Oh, there goes my game, it's over. And fortunately, we salvaged enough film that didn't get spoiled to come up with a, I guess it was a 28 minute film. Maybe that was a blessing in disguise because it did get good reviews and the people who were reviewing it were sports writers who had been there in person and they knew the, the obstacles. The film was a success. Uh, Pete Rosell called it the best football film he had ever seen and maybe at that point it was. So Blair Motion Pictures was up and running and this is my first screen credit. I was an assistant editor to John Butterworth. By 1964, we were ready to shoot our first full season, and we had to produce highlight films for all 14 teams. Now, this footage was shot in the preseason, and we used it to test the cameraman and the equipment, and also, we had to decide whether we were going to use color or the cheaper black and white film. Back in those days, teams barnstormed around the country for exhibition games, and they did it to promote the league in out-of-the-way places. They'd go to, like, Wheeling, West Virginia, Tulsa, Oklahoma. This footage shows you how far the league has come. You know, some of these towns had only baseball diamonds to play on, and there were minor league ballparks. You'd be up there, there wasn't a bathroom. Others had speakers and lights. We had to shoot from the roof. Uh, we had really bad camera positions. But then when we got a clear shot, it was like a who's who of all the great players of the day, because a lot of those guys would play a lot during preseason. Uh, but, you know, since it was preseason, teams were still rehearsing for the year, and uh, there were a lot of screw-ups. And we had no idea how to use this stuff. You know, at the time, we'd look at this and say, God, this is embarrassing. We can't show this. But years later, these shots would come to be known as follies, and we would use them in what would become our most successful film ever, The Football Follies. But also, during that preseason, we experimented with wind-up handheld cameras to show the game from the ground level. Dad called these guys who got this assignment moles. I think that was Ed's term because you were down on the ground and you were, you know, uh, walking around like some uh, subterranean rodent, uh, ergo the term mole. It was his job to go down on the field with 100 feet of film and just go through both teams and get extreme close-ups of everybody's face. That was the only chance we could get to get their faces without the helmets. So that was the way we got the, the facials. We were just looking for personalities, and, and uh, I remember you would have to ask the guy to, to take his helmet off so you could see, I mean, an introductory piece, very much of a cliche even then as it is now, but uh, it, it helped fill the gap. Let's see if I can remember some of these mole shots. This is George Izo, a redskin backup quarterback. The man with the biggest thighs in the NFL, Israel Lang. John David Crow with a rare smile. Here's Billy Truax. He was 81 with the Browns, and two weeks later, after a trade, he's 87 with the Rams. Let me see who that's. That's J.D. Smith. I think this number 20 is Paul Martha of the Steelers, 25 of the Eagles. I don't know who the hell that is. Now, one thing, you won't see any close-ups of the Chicago Bears, and that's because Bear owner George Hallis refused to let us shoot any of his players without their helmets off. He says, I don't want any facials. That's what he used to call a, a close-up. And he said, I don't want to single out a player. It's a team sport. If you single out a player and he gets a facial in our highlight film, then he's going to come to me and want more money. So you never saw any close-ups of any Chicago Bears. Well, by the time the preseason ended, we thought we were ready. And luckily, we made the decision to shoot color film. What can you do with Illuminator that you...
Sports Challenge, weeknights at 7 on ESPN Classic. Name the last team to sweep a World Series. If you can beat these guys, you know you're old school. Well, this is opening day, 1964, and we were up and shooting long before the game started. We were all so excited that we shot anything. And at the time, we had no use for all these fan shots, but everybody was so excited that we shot them anyway. But now, looking back, I'm glad we saved them. This is sort of a 60s fashion show. The music you're hearing is also a lost treasure. It comes from the first selections recorded for Blair Motion Pictures between 1962 and 65, and the composer was Malin Merrick, and he was from Hollywood. He was a popular film composer in the 1960s, and we wanted to use music that reflected the temper and the style of the modern era. There were no dome stadiums then, and artificial turf hadn't even been invented yet. The media was just starting to take notice of the NFL, but high tech, it wasn't. There were no digital game clocks, uh, the scoreboards were manual. Well, there's a job for you. I wonder who those guys were that had to work in that scoreboard. Lines were painted on the dirt because by November all the grass had been worn off. But playing in the dirt was no problem compared to having the goal posts on the goal line. And I, I can't imagine why it took the league so long to move the posts back to the back of the end zone. It just seemed that once a week players would get racked up on the posts. Well, we were all having a great time and we were just a bunch of young guys who loved making movies and who loved pro football and wanted to convey our love of the game to whoever was watching our movies. Looking at this footage, doesn't this seem like this was a more innocent time and maybe the players had more fun playing the game? The first season we shot thousands of feet of goofy things, color, pageantry, and we had no idea how to use it. Now just look at this stuff. Look at it. Look at these balloons. You know why there's balloons? Because Pete Roselle loved balloons. And the teams would use them whenever he would attend one of their games. Pete Roselle's going to be at the game. You knew balloons were going to go up. No show business types here. This is just high school bands. And out of all the thousands of anonymous halftime characters, we finally found one we recognized. You know who this is? This is Sybil Shepherd, Miss Teenage America. None of the rest of these people ever made it to Hollywood. We shot everything, no matter what the conditions. In fact, in the beginning, we didn't like bad weather, but then when we saw shots like this, we prayed for bad weather. This was combat photography. And this is when those dirt fields turned to a quagmire, but that's when the fun started. But see, a lot of our cameras were Araflexes, and they'd been used in World War II, so they were combat tested, they never broke down, they kept rolling. The pictures we used to get when the weather was bad we always used to say, gee, these are better than the great sunshine pictures. When we had a driving rainstorm and we had the, the, the cleats and the feet sliding and sloshing through the mud, and when a fellow would come at the camera and he'd slide right up to the camera, right in front of the lens, they were marvelous pictures. But the problem was then the film stocks were slower and sometimes the lights weren't that good, the stadiums, and it would get so dark it just looked like we were shooting in some sort of primordial ooze. You know, as, as far as I'm concerned, this stuff is much more dramatic than a, a day on AstroTurf in a dome. This was football, and in football, the show goes on, no matter what the weather. Fog. This was also a great cinematic backdrop for our movies. And this 1965 game between the Redskins and the Colts had a sort of a Hound of the Baskervilles feeling. This was duplicated 20 years later, you'll remember, in a playoff game between the Bears and the Eagles in Soldier's Field. For some reason, we had an end zone camera here, and we got this classic shot 
of Lenny Moore. In fact, this game was full of a lot of lost treasures, including the longest one we found. This is Jerry Logan. Intercepting a Sonny Jurgensen pass goes back 104 yards. Colts won this game 45-17. He could go all the way. Why haven't we ever seen this shot? I haven't the foggiest. Hey, Daisy, I ever tell you I did some modeling before I got on TV, much like yourself? <laughs> really? Uh, where? Department store underwear ads, mainly. Hey, would you like to join me and my friends while we go try on some new thongs? Yeah. You know, we models drink Miller Lite because it's so smooth. But you know, I drink Miller Lite because it tastes great. See, I knew it. You're no model. Oh, I am wearing a thong. Backwards, I think. Miller Lite. Taste a true Pilsner. You want to see? Dandruff, scratching, itching. Introducing new Neutrogena T-Gel Stubborn Itch Control with cooling menthol you feel on contact. Unlike self-control, it works. Ask any dermatologist. This is ESPN Classic. The one thing I love about looking at all these lost treasures is the way it brings nearly forgotten players back to life. Like Pete Retzlaff, he was the premier possession receiver of his day. Uh, he could catch the ball in a crowd, and he would have been great in today's West Coast offenses. This is Detroit's Nick Petrosani. He was a fullback I could identify with. Slow, but every step meant something. Now, we got this shot of Rick Caceres despite the Hallis no close-up rule. Looks like a character in a Martin Scorsese movie. He was from North Jersey. My favorite rediscovery was this guy, Big Joe Rutkins, who played defensive tackle for the Redskins. He was number 72, and he was a Redskin captain for all 10 years he was in the league. And each game, he'd start out neat and tidy at the toss of the coin, but by the end of the first play, somehow his shirt tail was out. It's funny, here, here's a tough guy made all pro, but what I remember most was his shirt tail always being out. My stomach does hang out a little, and it's hard to keep the shirt in, and it wasn't comfortable in. I used to blame it on the offensive lineman for my jersey being out from holding and uh, pulling it out from the whole run too tight. My wife always said that I look like an unmade bed, and I haven't lost much weight since then. I'm about the same size. That was the name of the whole game, was sacking the quarterback. And even if you, if he has already thrown the ball, you still like to hit him a little bit, let him know you're around. You're always asking about my shirt staying in. The shirt stays in now, but the tie won't stay where it's supposed to. Bucky Pope, he had the best nickname, the Catawba Claw. And he had a spectacular rookie season in 1964 with the Rams. We went looking for him, and believe it or not, we found him 20 miles right here from NFL Films. He was working as an executive in a steel company. Well, the college that I played for was not necessarily renowned for first-round draft picks. It was tiny Catawba College in Salisbury, North Carolina. Now, if you would have asked anybody in that camp, who's the guy least likely to make this team? They'd have said, that guy there, that, that guy from Catawba. Where is that place? What's that place all about? But I will tell you this, the one guy that I was absolutely certain was going to make that team was me. And I was smitten. I was tunneled, I was narrowed, and I was going to make that team somehow, some way. So here's a guy that was six feet five, could run, and was catching the ball. The Catawba Claw. That name's just fun to say. And somehow, some way, that crazy nickname caught on and, frankly, is fairly alive and well to this day. The Claw had 10 touchdowns and just 25 catches, and he averaged 47 yards per touchdown catch. That's 10 yards more per catch than Randy Moss. And we had a guy that could throw the ball. That was Gabriel. And um, I was pretty talented catching a long ball. Well, I'd like to think that I'd had a 10-year career, a couple of Super Bowl rings, a candidate for the Hall of Fame. <laughs> but then ran afoul of the sophomore jinx, I guess is the way you would describe it as far as I was concerned. It was fairly seriously hurt and never, ever recovered from that initial knee injury. 
nobody can ever, ever take away from you what you accomplished. And that is, I am the Catawba Claw. There's only one of me. And I'm very, very proud of that. In our research, we found outstanding plays by men like Joe Rutkins and the Catawba Claw. I love saying that name, the Catawba Claw. But we didn't find any of the best shots of legends like John Unitas and Jim Brown because we've been using them in our shows for years. But what we did find in the Lost Treasures were examples of legends being human. Like this shot, flawless Raymond Berry actually dropping a catchable pass. This probably happened once a year. And what about this shot of Unitas? Looks like the clumsy free agent from Louisville he once was. Baseball was the most popular sport of the day, and it was followed closely by college football. So we weren't about to show Superman Jimmy Brown going down with an arm tackle. Pete Rozelle felt the league needed to create superstars that were far superior to anything you could see in college. That's why you never saw any of these shots in our highlights. But what we were forgetting was that viewers love to see their heroes make mistakes. They could identify with a guy messing up. Some of the mistakes seemed prophetic. Jackie Smith didn't drop that many passes. But this one, this one looks a lot like another sure touchdown gone bad that Smith duplicated in Super Bowl 13 as a Dallas Cowboy. Actually, we did find footage of legends at their best. It was in our Pro Bowl coverage from the early years that rarely got used because the uniforms didn't match with the rest of the games and sometimes the numbers were different and the teams didn't want to use the footage in the highlights. But where else could you find George Hallis coaching John Unitas and Don Shula working with Fran Tarkenton? Now, because none of this footage got used, all of the best remained in the outs. Jim Brown refusing to go down. Jimmy Taylor running the Green Bay sweep. Bear tight end Mike Ditka being his belligerent self. Super quick Chicago safety, Rosie Taylor. Scrambling Fran Tarkin and throwing to Boom Boom Brown. Dave Parks making a block to spring Tommy Mason. John Mackey going deep. Detroit's Terry Barr making a fingertip catch. That's too bad this interception by Green Bay linebacker Ray Nitschke wasn't in a regular season game because in his contract with Lombardi, Nitschke got a $50 bonus for every pass he intercepted. Now looking back, it seems to me that the pro bowlers of the 60s played harder in this game than they do now. Just watch this, Doug Atkins, number 81, rushed the quarterback. In the 1964 game, number 89, Gino Marchetti, delivered this message to quarterback Frank Ryan. And there's a great story about this. Marchetti felt that the Browns had run up the score two weeks earlier in the NFL championship game. And he told Ryan after the game, listen, you don't do that, and I'm going to get you. And he did in this Pro Bowl. But number 77, Eugene Big Daddy Lipscomb, was the most dominating defender in Pro Bowl history. They used to say he could tilt the field. Now, in this footage from 1963, Big Daddy dominated the best defensive lineman in the league. He was 6'7", 300, but he didn't beat up the guy in front of him. Pursuit was his specialty. He didn't spend a lot of time pounding on the blockers. He was out to pound the ball carrier, the quarterback. Big Daddy was MVP that day, but no one could have known that this was also his last game. Big Daddy died six weeks later. Dandruff, scratching, itching. 800 Classic to get ESPN Classic. 
defensive play in the 1960s was as basic as hand-to-hand -hand combat. Defenses back then were built on the premise that a good player becomes less good when he's hit so hard that he doesn't want to be hit again. Now, a lot of these hard hits never appeared in our shows because at the time, most of the teams wanted to emphasize their offense and their scoring. The typical highlight package of the day consisted of touchdowns and not much else. So unless it was an interception return for a touchdown, defenses largely got ignored, but not in the lost treasures. We were especially impressed in going through this old footage with the play of the defensive backs. Now, they were a hell of a lot more aggressive back then. A lot of times, they'd let the receiver catch the ball just to give him a good whack and then knock it loose. Receivers were like scraps of meat being tossed into a dog kennel. Number 22, that's Jimmy Lynch. Mel Renfro, Hall of Famer, number 20. Number 39 is one of the most underrated DBs of all time, Kermit Alexander of the 49ers. Now, one of the best of the defensive backs was a scrappy Steeler cornerback named Brady Keyes, but because the Steelers were so lousy back then, his big plays seldom made the highlight reels. Well, we decided to track Brady down, and we found him in Albany, Georgia. Oddly enough, he was more celebrated off the field than he ever was on it. Brady Keyes, what we call it, the history in the making, the black pioneer, uh, because I've been the first in so many things, is uh, the first black man on the Kentucky Fried Chicken. If you look closely, I had my picture there instead of the colonel, and my name underneath there instead of the colonel. But the colonel and I were, were such good friends. I mean, we were both pioneers. You know, we had something in common. My whole attitude about everything changed when I was on the football field. You can imagine, boy, that was the Brady Keys. When I was on the football field, I was no nice guy. My game plan when I went to play was not just to cover a receiver. That was not it. My game plan was to shut him out. When he got one pass on me, I was pissed. I tried to kill him after that. I tried to beat him up for catching that pass on me. But believe me, I was such a cocky little defensive back, I did not believe, I did not believe that anybody could beat me. I just didn't believe it. There was no rule against close lining, so I did it. There was no rule against chopping and my little throat chop, so I did it. I invented things that the rules didn't cover. Is that dirty? I don't think so. The things I used to do, they put me out of the game nowadays. I wouldn't last, I wouldn't last a quarter. I wouldn't last any time. Why? because I would stop the receiver. They don't want you to stop no receivers. Now they want that receiver to run down and score touchdowns and the crowd holler and the television ratings go up. That's entertainment. And you had the audacity to ask me, <laughs> was it rougher in the 60s? Give me a break. <laughs> That's a funny question. Excuse me for laughing. <laughs> Feisty little Brady Keys played at a time when all-out brawls were not that uncommon. Now, we weren't supposed to shoot them, but uh, now it can be revealed that sometimes we did. Actually, the fights were not as violent as what happened when the ball was in play. And this was all legal in the 1960s. Clotheslining, leg whipping, Head slaps, crackbacks, they wouldn't get you fined or suspended. They wouldn't even get you penalized. They also wouldn't get you into the highlight film until now.
think back in them days, they used to have what they called hatchet men. They'd be sent into a game for one reason, to put somebody out of the game. And there would be times a quarterback or somebody could be walking back to the huddle and a guy come up and hit them. They'd get thrown out of the game, but that was their job. Quarterbacks weren't protected the way they are today. When they pulled the ball down the run, they were free game. They were popped like paper bags. Hook slides hadn't been invented, so there was no place for them to hide. The quarterbacks weren't even safe when they tried to get out of bounds. Now, it was illegal to hit a man out of bounds. It's just that the rules weren't strictly enforced. A couple of strides, more or less, what the hell, uh, you know, it didn't seem to matter. Now, the Eagles tried to prevent injuries by putting used mattresses in the landing zones. Nobody was safe, though. Defenses in those days were on a search-and-destroy mission. Even the, the great Jim Brown got ambushed. Today's players, you know, you hear that they're bigger and faster, but I think the game in the 60s was more violent. Check this shot out from number 74, the Steelers' Irvin Henry. That's a cheap shot. Despite what you've seen, they did have referees in the 1960s. And occasionally, they found reason to throw their hankies. You know, I'd forgotten that the ref's flags were white until 1965. But other than that, the reaction of the players was just the same as it is today. That 70-year-old George Howard, he said he knew it was time to retire when he couldn't keep pace with officials when he was disputing the penalties they were marching off. After seeing these lost treasures, I think if today's rules had been in effect in the 1960s, a lot of Hall of Famers would have been fined more than they earned. Hi there. Can we get you anything? Oh, no, I'm fine. Are you enjoying your stay, sir? <laughs> ah, you're on vacation, huh? No business, but the best Western for a seminar. Isn't that still going on? Workshops today. Agony of defeat. It was the one show that had it all. Now the best is back. Classic wide world of sports. This week, a wave of wide world action with Hawaii's best surfers and worst wipeouts. Oh, Get fired up with one of the wildest races ever and the good, the bad, and the ugly of arm wrestling. Hang 10 with Classic Wide World of Sports. Friday at 8, only on ESPN Classic. This is ESPN Classic. Going into 1965, we kept trying to work out the bugs in our coverage. At San Francisco's Kizar Stadium, we kept seeing these strange intermittent flashes in the footage. We didn't know what the hell it was. Then one game, we shot in slow motion and discovered it was a flock of seagulls from San Francisco Bay. Then in New York's Yankee Stadium, we had a bad top position, and it was so low that the plays that went into the near sideline were obscured by the bench. And then we still had some freelancers who just couldn't follow the ball. Now, one of my dad's favorite slogans was flap, finish like a pro, label your film cans, put away your equipment. But there were two things that really drove him crazy. I had a fetish about two things in our movies, and one was focus, and the other was exposure, because that's where our cameramen made their most mistakes. You know, the color, the exposure would be wrong. But why don't you use a meter? You got the meter, use it. Well, they didn't want to use the meter, you know, they're lazy. I want a picture's out of focus that's so amateurish it made me sick. I couldn't stand to see a, a, f a picture out of focus. Why couldn't you focus the picture? You know, Ed is a very impulsive and impetuous gentleman. And I remember when um, we first got involved with the cameras, you know, most people would buy one or two and test it through a season. Well, 
Ed uh, found out that, uh, you know, more is better, so he bought 12 of them right out of the chute. We took those 12 wind-up cameras and put them to work. We stopped shooting all those stiff, posed pre-game shots. Now, our moles were down on their knees, sneaking into the bench area, looking for candid close-ups. Although, I'm not quite sure what this cameraman was trying to shoot. These early handheld cameras didn't have zoom lenses like they have today, so if the play went away from you, you were sunk. On the other hand, if the play came toward the camera, you might get lucky if you held your ground and you'd get a good shot. But then if it came too close, you were sunk again. Now this was all tricky business, not an exact science. We just wanted to show the game the way the players experienced it. Before long, our best moles started thinking along with the quarterbacks and anticipating where the plays might be run. More and more, they started to guess right, and we started getting a few of the ground shots that NFL films would one day be famous for. The favorite spot was a corner of the end zone. It's a good place to catch a flag pattern. Then, even after you guessed right, a great shot like this, like this uh, run by the Lions' Amos Marsh, could be ruined by a hair in the frame. Another limitation of these primitive ground cameras was the speed. You couldn't shoot a lot of slow motion because the 100-foot film load lasted only two minutes. Now, that wasn't the case for the top camera, which carried 12-minute loads and had more film. And right away, we started to develop the super slow motion coverage, which would become one of our trademarks. In fact, Dad made it a priority to shoot slow motion, even though it cost a lot more. When you shoot slow motion through a movie camera, the film is going through there like water out of a spigot. And boy, it's just building up dollars. It's like a, like a taxi cab meter. And nobody wanted to take that expense. But it was so great to see slow motion in football lend itself so much because of the movements, almost like a ballet. The runs especially, where they would miss tackles and slide, and the great extensions for the passes. And that's all the people talked about. And I thought, if that's all the people are talking about, and that's what they like, then hell, I'm going to give them the whole game that way. So I loaded up the cameras. I said, we're going to invest the money. We're going to shoot every play slow motion. The thing that strikes me about these slow-mo shots is why were these still in the outs? Jeez, look at this, look at this Lenny Moore run. I can't believe that we never used this. A lot of people would say, Ed, how did you decide to shoot that game in slow motion? Well, I shot every play in slow motion. I love playing tennis, but being a mom is even better. When I took the Hooked on Phonics reading challenge with... <laughs> the 1965 season saw the arrival of two rookies who would become great for our films and for pro football in general. Number 40, Gail Sayers, and number 51, Dick Butkus. Now, they started out as special teamers for the Bears. Sayers was so unique that every time the Bears played, all of the editors would argue over who would be able to cut that film. And Butkus was giving us a reason to use defensive plays in the highlight shows for the first time. Even then, we knew the significance of these two new stars that we could promote and how they represented the passing of the torch. Once again, Jim Brown had led the league in rushing, but no one knew that this was going to be his last season. He had made up his mind to retire at the peak of his career, and the 1965 Pro Bowl would be the last game he would ever play. The man sure knew how to go out in style. In my mind, Jim Brown is the greatest NFL player ever.
He was the MVP of the last football game of his life. And for the first time, we used our company's new name on the credits. Blair Motion Pictures had been bought by the NFL, and we were now NFL Films. The NFL is online at www.nfl.com. For more, log on to ESPN.com. Part of Go Network. Go.com.